All right. Welcome, everybody. We are in our third session of the day, second to last session of the conference. This is Keeping It Local, Perspectives from Washington's Community Forests. My name is Katie Fields, and I am the Forests and Communities Program Manager at Washington Environmental Council. First, just a couple of logistical notes to get started with. If you are running into any issues during this session, um, or have questions about the conference, please email the address that's pinned in the chat box to the right of the webinar screen. You can also use the chat box to send messages, but keep in mind that any messages will be visible to all attendees. And if you'd like to submit any questions to the speakers, please use the Q&A feature, which you can access in your toolbar at the bottom of your webinar screen. We will be sorting through the questions and presenting them to the speakers at the end of the presentation. And as a reminder, this session will be recorded and shared with all participants next week. All right, let's go ahead and get started. Ecological forest management and local priorities go hand in hand in Washington's community forests. As working forests operated by tribes, land trusts, and or local governments, these lands are managed for a broad range of community goals through a variety of management approaches. In this session, our experts will share highlights from their community forest projects as the Kalispell Indian Creek Community Forest and the Nisqually Community Forest. These two for these two forests showcase tribal and partnership oriented approaches to managing community forests for goals that include research, education, carbon sequestration, and ecosystem resilience. Then Ben, then ben Donatel from the Washington Recreation and Conservation Office, or RCO, will also provide an update on the RCO Community Forest Grant Program, including successes from previous years and looking ahead to funding in the upcoming legislative session. Now I'd like to go ahead and introduce you to our speakers. We have Ray Enns, who is the Director of Wildlife and Terrestrial Resources for the Kalispell Tribe Natural Resources Department. Justin Hall, who is the Vice President of the Nisqually Community Forest. David Trout is the Natural Resources Director of the Nisqually Tribe. And Ben Donatel is a Natural Resource Policy Specialist for the Washington State Recreation and Conservation Office. Before we jump into the first presentation, we'd like to share with you a short three minute video that provides an overview of community forests. This video was part of an excellent and ongoing video storytelling project through our partners at the Northwest Community Forest Coalition. At the end of today's session, we will share the link to the full project and you can check out all of the videos. But for now, let's take a look at Community Forests 101. The simplest definition of community forest would be a forest that's managed for multiple purposes as defined by the local community, and it's also owned and managed by a local community. One thing that I think is a real benefit of the community forest model is it allows the average citizen an opportunity to engage more in the forestry. So they're able to learn what active management looks like and that it doesn't need to be in conflict with recreation or ecosystem services. I picture a community forest as a place where there's sustainable harvest and sustainable use of the forest, and the priorities for those uses are set by community members. The community forest management approach is one that has truly community benefits, whether that's economic benefits, environmental benefits, recreational benefits. That is what makes the community forest program the community forest program, is the fact that all of the community, again, however defined, that they get to participate in the development of the management. The community forest is my favorite classroom. There's so much there in just one spot. You can learn about so many different things and we're fortunate that the tribe has worked so hard to develop that area to educate our youth and our people. I'd say a community forest to me has a huge range of different meanings. We are thinking about sort of regenerative systems. So how is this landscape function 10 years, 50 years, 100 years in the future? And to me, that's a community forest is the meeting of the human community and the ecological community in a way that it's mutually beneficial. People are impacted in pretty profound ways by the places that they live, and people impact the places that they live and shape the places that they live in pretty profound ways as well. So to me, community forestry really means recognizing 
what are these deep and unique connections that community have to the forest that they live in and giving communities the agency to shape and manage the places that they live in ways that reflect who they are. Thank you. And so we actually have another short clip that we'd like to show leading into our first presenter, Ray Enns. This is from the Indian Creek Community Forest that Ray Enns manages uh, with Kalispell. And so we'll go ahead and take it away with just a brief portion of that. You can always check out the full video on the link that we'll share at the end of the session today. They set up some public meetings where people from all over the county came and gave ideas about how it should be managed. For the Kalispell tribe, their emphasis seems to be on education of the public. What I have seen from the Kalispell tribes is just an incredible openness to work with the community and to develop connections with people in the community to work together on projects. It's, it's really amazing. I tell people that our local Native American tribe up here is this open and this outgoing and they're just absolutely amazed. All right, and that leads us to hand it over to our first speaker, Ray Entz from the Calispell Tribe. Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to the session. Um, hopefully I can set a medium bar for everybody, um, maybe low enough that uh, everything else past mine will be great. Um, well, welcome. And I'm going to talk today a little bit about the Indian Creek Community Forest, uh, which just happens to be uh, one of, uh, I think, the first two tribally owned and managed um, community forests in the country. So we went through a process in uh, 19, or actually 2012, we were part of the first uh, United States Forest Services uh, Community Forest and Open Space Grant Program re uh, grant request. So we were one of the first 10 selected uh, community forests in the, in the nation. So we're pretty proud of being able to, to, to get to that point. Um, it was a very unique project and how the funding came about, as most of you who have participated in that grant process um, may or may not know, there aren't a lot of individual funds that are associated with that program. It's um, a, a smaller federal program in the $2 million range. And, and of course, the I think the maximum amount of funding through the Forest Service is about 400,000. So we were, uh, fortunate enough to be able to pool both tribal resources and uh, federal hydropower mitigation resources to to buy a larger chunk of ground uh, to create uh, the community forest concept for Indian Creek. Uh, the focus of Indian Creek has really been um, in developing a not only a tribal management philosophy that's that's really pinned. Um, on wildlife habitat and, and wildlife outcomes, but to try to create that in a way where we engage the community and not only the tribal community, but the community um, at large. So most of Ponderay County, North Spokane, and some of West Bonner County and Idaho participated in our planning process to develop our mission and uh, vision statements for the community forest. So, the one thing that we strive to do is to try to, to um, develop an inclusive community in relationship to how the community force was, was formed and focused. And we did that um, largely by outreach. Uh, we tried an early process where we didn't really get a lot of um, uh, participation from the broader community. Uh, so we re-engaged through a partnership with the National Park Service and one of their grants for planning. And that really helped us uh, develop a, a community forest plan and engage the community in ways that we probably wouldn't have been able to do without them. And so 
looking at community forest and how it's juxtaposed, um, it's about a 600 acre property, but about 410 of it is forested landscape. And, and so the focus on, on the community forest is inside the green, the uh, bright green line there, um, where we specifically manage for those community forest activities. Um, it's largely in an educational and focused um, community forest. We have developed um, some light recreational opportunities that coincide with that education. And so this is just kind of a list of a lot of the um, activities that we've been able to um, kind of be successful in bringing to the um, Indian Creek Community Forest since its inception. Um, it's a slow process, but those things tend to have a uh, life of their own and they they kind of create a synergy and a community participation and more comes out of those each time. Um, so we're really proud to be able to host our very first Forest Landowner Education Field Day in June of 2023. It was a huge goal of ours to move forward with um, allowing that particular small forest landowner education um, opportunity through our community forest. And we hope that this is just one of many to come in the future. So given its juxtaposition, it's got a lot, of, a lot going on, including some irrigated cropland, which we feed our buffalo with, but um, it has an, um, a lot of different accoutrements that go along with it. Um, one being bull trout critical uh, habitat uh, as Indian Creek and all of, all of the related pieces that go into the community forest include a tribal member fishing pond where we've reintroduced them to clean uh, sources of fish protein as our river is laden uh, pretty heavily with um, uh, carcinogenic compounds in the fish biomass that's currently in the river. And then we've created forestry trails where we're uh, teaching people about our um, native plants, native trees. Um, we also have a native plant nursery where, for our restoration projects. Um, and we have just finished and are finishing the trail system for a small forest landowner demonstration project, which includes um, about nine different uh, prescriptions where landowners can view and see the different ways to complete forest treatments on their property and get a cost estimate um, and before, during, and after for each kind of um, activity from hand thinning to machine um, thinning and, and piling and burning. We actually were able to pull off a multi-jurisdictional seven-acre test burn on that project to show landowners um, that uh, given today's climate and moving forward in, uh, in partnership that prescribed fire is an option out there for folks as well. Uh, so this shows the nine, the nine different prescriptions um, and they are a, a variety of hand um, thinning, machine thinning, piling, burning, et cetera. And we do have the native plant nursery, which has been in the, in the, effect since 2012 and we've just refined it made a better operation and it grows all of our riparian and uh, wetland related uh, restoration hardwoods um, for the tribe and its um, conservation program we did the arboretum loop trail which is just a half mile trail which identifies all of the native uh, trees that are on site gives a little bit of information about each tree and shrub that you can find on the trail, including some interpretation with um, storytelling around cow spell uses when appropriate. Um, we also put on several different kinds of um, uh, landowner or uh, school age children days where we teach them things from archery, uh, water quality, uh, fish management, uh, overlanding, uh, navigation with compass, uh, all kinds of things. And uh, we have a few people to take uh, part in an ungroomed winter recreation situation. And again, teaching um, all about our forestry programs and 
um, forestry science as well. So the contact information here is basically for our information and outreach uh, coordinator, coordinator and policy analyst. His name is Mike Lithgow. Uh, he can be reached at uh, the following email address and phone number. And that's just a brief overview of Indian Creek. And I thank you for your time. And I look forward to the questions you may have. Thank you, Ray. We'll turn next to Justin Hall from the Nisqually Community Forest. I like how Ray puts up somebody else's email address. That's smart. I should have thought of that. Um, well, welcome everyone. And I'm gonna chat with you a little bit about the Nisqually Community Forest. Uh, the Nisqually Community Forest is an effort to purchase commercial forest lands within the Nisqually watershed and imagine them with a different set of priorities than the current industrial forest land owners. In a lot of ways, we are a, a salmon forest as we started in response to concerns over declining salmon runs and what could be done about that. Uh, we're located just north of Ashford in Pierce County, Washington State, just west of Mount Rainier National Park. Uh, through a variety of funding mechanisms, we have grown to 2,880 acres and have partnered with the Nisqually Tribe, assisting them in applying for and receiving the first green infrastructure clean water revolving fund loan from Washington State. Their first purchase from that loan was 1,201 acres contiguous to the Nisqually Community Forest for a total of 4,081 acres currently co-managed. Uh, just south of the Nisqually Community Forest is a large parcel owned by the Nisqually Land Trust. And this land was purchased with Section 6 Endangered Species funding. It's not actually managed, but it serves as the viewshed for the service-based economy of the Ashford area and that entry to uh, Mount Rainier National Park. So in managing any lands, there's always trade-offs. All forest management decisions, including no management, are a balancing act of determining the level of forest products that can be produced, along with non-timber forest products, opportunities for recreation, and other uses of the forest, ecosystem services, fish and wildlife habitat, et cetera. Currently, the most of the Michelle watershed is managed with short rotation, even age management in accordance with what is allowed under Washington forest practice rules to maximize forest products and returns to the investors slash owners. And I'm not passing any judgment on whether that is good or bad, it's just what meets the goals of the current owners. Our goals, however, are different. We're seeking to provide more of a balance across forest products, local jobs, very much salmon habitat and carbon sequestration. While we still harvest timber annually using local contractors whenever they are available, we put high priority on providing for the needs of salmon especially the federally threatened Nisqually Chinook and Steelhead. Our changes in forestry practices moving away from short rotation, even age management to uneven age management with multiple entry thinnings every 15 to 20 years also allows us to sequester more carbon and take advantage of the current voluntary carbon markets as an additional source of income. So to help us see how we could manage our forest in a way that was more beneficial for salmon, we turned to the Pacific Ecology Division of the EPA, specifically Bob McCain and the Velma model, what we've heard about a couple different times through this conference that his team created. And Velma is an eco-hydrological model that is dynamically stimulate, simulates the interaction of hydrological and biogeochemical processes across multiple scales. It's spatially distributed with each pixel within a watershed representing a soil column and vegetation with specific characteristics. Pixels are typically 30 meters square, but smaller or larger grids can be specified as well. Velma simulates the effects of climate and land use on stream flow, evapotranspiration, vertical and lateral flows, plant and soil, carbon and, and uh, nitrogen dynamics, and transport of dissolved nutrients and toxins. Uh, readily available data are used to apply the model using a daily time step. Some simu simulations may extend for centuries as necessary. Bob Seam recently built the data of Moore et al. into Velma specifically to examine how forest age influences stream flow. The Michelle River watershed, as I mentioned, is just west of Mount Rainier in Washington state and typically of intensive managed forest lands in the Western Cascades range. Short harvest rotations, typically 40 to 60 years and a conversion from old to young forest landscapes during the past century is what we've seen. So in the modeling, we wanted to address the question, can long rotation forestry improve summer low flow conditions that limit salmon migration and spawning in the Nisqually? Uh, basin. The A3 square mile Michelle River, Michelle River watershed is the principal salmon producing tributary to the Nisqually River. It generally recognized that late summer low flows in recent years are hindering salmon from reaching historically spawning habitat higher up in the Michelle. Whereas 40 years ago, the Michelle was known as one of the premier steelhead uh, and Chinook salmon rivers in the Pacific Northwest, fish populations have since plummeted for a number of reasons that may include decline 
in dry season stream flow. A recent decline in salmonoid populations has had a major impact on the Nisqually tribe, whose cultural traditions have long depended upon sustainable harvesting of salmon from the Nisqually Basin streams. And David Trout from the tribe is going to follow me to talk about that. So what's causing the decline in summer low flow? Large portion of Michelle subbasin had converted to young, intentionally managed forest during the latter decade of the 1900s. This is fairly typical of the Northwest West Side forest. Young, uh, vigorously growing forests will transpire over three times more water from old forests. This is based on experimental research from Moore and others and showing that those young trees act like straws that poke into the, the aquifer and just push that moisture up in, into the into the clouds and doesn't give it a chance to go down through the streams and provide that cool uh, water for salmon. Uh, other scientific data, Jones and Post, Perry and Jones, Segura et al, along with anecdotal information from fishing stories, distant past to present, support the idea that older forests tend to generate sustainable, substantially greater stream flow than dry summer during the dry summer months in the Pacific Northwest. And this graph that we've also seen before shows the difference in transpiration between a young and a very old forest from more at all. If we look at the Michelle forest uh, in the subbasin, albeit in 1990, so 30 years ago now, we show that it skews young. The somewhat older stands that you see in the middle, the lighter greens are the Washington DNR's Elbe Hill State Forest, which has been a testbed for innovative forest management. In the intervening 30 years since this data is collected, harvest has picked up speed, and today the age distribution skews even younger. Oops. Back one slide. Come on, there we go. Um, I'm somehow lost my data points on the top of the, the graphs, but the question we've asked is, will older forests with longer harvest intervals increase summer flows? The results of the multiple model run show the answer is yes. Longer rotations will increase base stream flow, especially during the dry late summer months. Currently, the USGS gauge shows an average minimum flow in August of six cubic feet per second. That's the blue bar. If we model managing the entire Michelle subbasin to a 40 year harvest interval, the minimum is predicted to go down to two cubic feet per second, the red bar. And if we can raise the average age of the forest to 100 years, we can increase the stream flow to 11 cubic feet per second, which is the green bar, which can have a critical impact on salmon survival as the summer temperatures continue to climb. Now that we own the land, and, and the, really the best way to make changes to land if you want to see them is to own it and do it yourself, we've instituted change in the management techniques that were being used on the land. The standard industrial forest management of clear cuts has given way to a magic technique allowing um, us to do multiple entry thinnings um, to meet our goals. Uh, most of the stands we have purchased are heavily overstocked, and so we are working a way to get them into a healthy condition. Uh, one on the left is the way we received it, and different stand on the right that's recently been thinned. Once we get through our first innings, we'll plan on re-entering the stands every 15 to 20 years to create a forest with a heterogeneous age class and uh, just a wide variety of openings and, and denser forest and whatnot, and raise the overall age of the forest in line with what are found from our Velma results. Uh, we've also enrolled the first portion of the Squally Community Forest into a carbon project. This is a carbon-friendly forest conference after all, and we plan to enroll the newer purchases in the subsequent carbon projects in the next year or two. That's what I've got. Thank you very much. Thank you, Justin. It's always great to hear about all of the different objectives that are being reached uh, with One Community Forest. And I look forward to hearing some more about the partnership um, from David Trout. We'll hand it over to you next. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is David Trout. I'm the Natural Resources Director for the Nisqually Indian Tribe. And I've been in this position since 1987 working on fisheries issue for the Nisqually tribe. And there's definitely a treaty rights connection to carbon forestry and all the things that we're talking about. And Justin did a great job of laying out the technical details around why we're interested in doing some of the community forest from a water watershed perspective. But let me suggest that the Nisqually tribe has many interests in, in why it's getting involved in developing a community forest. And certainly first and foremost, is a sense of urgency around salmon recovery. 
Uh, as Justin pointed out, the Michelle is one of our primary producers of uh, ESA listed Chinook and steelhead in the Nisqually. And we've seen precipitous declines in their populations over the last 25 years. When I started in 1987, the Nisqually Indian tribe was fishing 105 days a year sustainably and have been doing so for a long time. But um, in 2015, we fished eight days as a response to diminishing resources. And the salmon runs are declining rapidly and it's mainly as a result of habitat degradation and things like water temperature and water availability in our tributaries that are critical for us. So uh, getting into community forestry to improve flow conditions and habitat conditions in the Michelle made a lot of sense for us. And it's one of our highest priorities in terms of salmon recovery. And our hope is that over time, it'll provide more time on the water for our fishermen to engage in their treaty right. One of the hats I wear is also chair of the Nisqually River Council. It's the oldest watershed council west of the Mississippi. And it's a community-based organization that represents interests from the mountain to the sea, uh, citizens, the local governments, the tribes coming together to forward a watershed stewardship plan that includes maintaining local economies and the health of our communities. And so developing a community forest is also very consistent with that community-based desire to have a strong, vibrant local economy and have the income that's derived from our forest uh, stay in the watershed. Um, as a result of changes over the last 20 years, we've seen our timberland ownership go from large family ownerships like the Weyerhaeuser family to much smaller real estate investment trust where most of the benefits and profits from our forest go out of the watershed. And in fact, a little factoid that our uh, executive director for our Nisqually Land Trust years ago liked to say was that I believe it was in 2015, the primary beneficiary of timber harvest in the Nisqually watershed was the Plumbers Union in Paris, France, simply as a result of investments and management of these forests by non-family uh, members, by a real estate investment trust, the money left the watershed. So one of our interests is to return it to local ownership to support family wage jobs and to keep the money in the Nisqually watershed. We're also really interested in repatriating some of these lands for the Nisqually Indian tribe. This is the traditional homelands of the tribe. We've been here for thousands and thousands of years, but have lost access to a lot of these lands that they've converted to different uses and to different ownerships. And uh, with the goal of restoring our community forest in the upper Nisqually of somewhere between 30 and 50,000 acres, those are 30 or 50,000 acres that our tribal members will have access to for traditional purposes and cultural purposes and gathering plant materials and hunting and doing things that are important for maintaining the Nisqually tribe's connection to the landscape. And so certainly that's a big driving motivation factor for us. And as I mentioned, our goal being 30 to 50,000 acres, we're talking between 120 to $200 million based on today's values for land in the upper watershed which makes it very challenging to put together a big community forest. And so we're trying to be as creative as possible on our funding streams that we're using to acquire this. We've used salmon recovery funding board dollars for salmon recovery based projects. We've also used a lot of our own tribal dollars to help grow the community forest. We've been successful in obtaining a Clean Water Act revolving grant through the Department of Ecology that we've used some of those funds to acquire some of these commercial timberlands. And then finally, also looking at the stream flow restoration programs dealing with water issues in the state of Washington. We've been successful in getting some grants through that program. So it takes a lot of, uh, a, a lot of dollars to make this happen. And, and unfortunately, there isn't a single source. We're having to cobble together a bunch of different sources. And we're hopeful that at some point, bigger sources will become available because this kind of thing is really important, not just for um, what we're trying to accomplish today with salmon recovery, but this is a generational kind of project that'll leave a different community, a different watershed for future tribal members and future members of our watershed community to enjoy. And um, as Billy Frank, uh, our tribal elder leader used to say, if you want a hundred year old trees, you got to plant them and wait a hundred years. And so if we want those trees to be a hundred years old, in many places, we have to plant them now and the best way to do that, as Justin pointed out, is by owning the land and doing it ourselves. And so that's our commitment to this community forest program. We think it's of tremendous value to our tribe and to our community. And we're going to be doing this for the long haul. And so thank you all for the opportunity to speak to you. 
Thank you very much, David. And that sets us up to talk uh, with Ben Donatel next, who uh, runs the Recreation and Conservation Office Community Forest Grant Program, which is one of those funding sources that's a newer funding source um, that helps to support the acquisition of community forests in the state. Yeah, thanks, Katie. And thanks to all the other presenters today. Um, really appreciate the opportunity to be here and talk a little bit about uh, RCO's Community Forest Program. See, I'm going to back her up on. There we go. Um, so I think David highlighted um, a lot of the challenges when you're looking across large landscapes of um, stitching together uh, a whole bunch of different funding programs to accomplish a variety of really fantastic goals. Um, you know, this community forest program at RCO, I think is um, a fantastic program. It's also when you're talking about, you know, $200 million across uh, 20 or 30,000 acres in a landscape is a drop in the bucket. And so we're proud of this program. We are really excited to um, keep it going. Uh, this is, we've had two grant rounds now. And, um, you know, for me, uh, working on this program now for, for a few years, this is one of the most exciting programs I think we have to offer at RCO. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about the program generally. Um, I'm gonna showcase uh, some of the nuts and bolts of the program, talk about uh, you know, what we've been able to accomplish with the program across the state overall, and then talk about looking forward a little bit here. So in uh, 2020, the Washington State Legislature asked us as RCO um, to develop a set of evaluation criteria, uh, funding criteria, and, and um, develop a ranked project list for funding consideration by the legislature. Um, and they gave us about six months to do that work, which was a pretty tight timeline, but we were fortunate to have a lot of great partners uh, to pull into this effort to help um, make this program possible. Uh, Ray sat on the original advisory committee that helped us develop the program. Um, many others across the community forest, you know, community uh, of practice really pitched in, rolled up their sleeves and helped us, you know, uh, come up with a pretty good program, I think, for, for, um, for the first go around. Um, and so I just want to read kind of the purpose statement from our grant manual, because I think it sort of sums up a lot of the themes that um, the presenters were talking about here today uh, and, and really the focus of our program here. Uh, and it says, the purpose of this program is to protect and maintain actively managed forests consistent with local land use planning. Fragment and fragmentation and development of forest lands results in greater risks of impact to communities, wildfire and climate change, and deprives communities of the economic, environmental, cultural, recreational, and educational opportunities a community forest can provide. The community forest program provides funding to help communities protect and enhance their surrounding forest lands by acquiring land and developing collaborative models of community-based forest management and use. Um, I love that. I think it's just really a good uh, really captures the intent and the spirit of, of what we're trying to create with this program. Um, so, like I said, we pulled together an advisory committee uh, to help us develop this program. It uh, consisted of folks from industry, the small forest landowner community, uh, the Northwest Community Forest Coalition, the land trust and conservation communities. Uh, we had a couple tribes represented on the on the advisory committee. Um, you know, and, and it was really this well-rounded, um, broad set of stakeholders that really came together to, um, to you know, define what this program is going to do. We had a little bit of direction from the legislature, but it was left pretty open to, um, to us to really define and develop what this program was going to do. Uh, some of the big challenges that we wrestled with within the committee was really you know, how do you define a community forest? We've heard, you know, from the presenters today, um, really different models of how communities engaged, how, you know, the, the management of the forest is uh, developed and, and takes place on the land. Um, 
we had to wrestle with issues of, you know, like, what can you do with the grant funds? Um, There's very little direction about that uh, in terms of acquiring property, restoring the land, developing, you know, recreational facilities or other assets on the, on the land. Um, you know, one of the big uh, focus, focal points of the committee was this idea of self-sufficiency and, and sort of, you know, how do you support, especially new community forests, uh, as they sort of get their feet under them um, in gaining that that sort of notion of self-sufficiency. Um, you know, and then how do you evaluate projects that that are really intentionally meeting very different goals across different landscapes? And so all of those things were really kind of a challenge, um, but fun, fun challenges to wrestle with. Um, so going in, oh, Looks like my my words didn't make it on the page there. That's all right. I was going to touch on some of the program details, um, things like uh, grant limits. You know, for this particular program, we set the grant limit a little bit higher um, than many of our programs. It's up to three million dollars with a fifteen percent match, which is a pretty low bar. Um, you know, and you can, applicants can meet that match requirement with a lot of different things, both um, dollars and in-kind um, resources as well. Um, the applic eligible applicants for this program include local government agencies, uh, nonprofit organizations like land trusts, uh, tribes, um, you know, we, uh, other sort of up jurisdictions of of local governments like uh like a forestry department or a um special purpose district like a port or a school district or a um you know community development authority things like that are all all eligible applicants in this program um there was an interesting uh provide or piece of the legislative direction that talked about sort of co-projects with state agencies um and and so the state agencies are eligible but they have to be be in partnership have some kind of a partner, partnership agreement with uh one of the other eligible applicants and then the grant funds um sorry i katie or michael my slides dis disappeared i'm not sure if that happened for everyone else there we go Thank you. Fantastic. Um, perfect. There we go. Uh, back on track. So yeah, and then use of the grant funds can go towards property acquisition. Uh, and then on the, on the property uh, acquired or on adjacent parcels of property that, um, you know, are kind of managed under the community forest, you can also uh, use a portion of the grant funds for restoration, uh, development of recreational facilities like trails and parking areas, restrooms, that kind of thing. Um, and then you can also use a small portion of the grant funds to develop or augment a community forest management plan um, for the lands acquired or for the larger community forest. So I just wanted to show a little bit of the program's impact since we started. And so you can kind of see on the slide here, the, the bright green trees are the applications from the 2022 grant round, which 2024 fiscal year here, um, which we're anticipating funding from the legislature uh, in the next legislative session. Uh, the darker green trees are the funded projects from the 2020 grant round, the original grant round. And then kind of the, the metrics on the side there, we received in 2020, we received 15 applications for projects. Uh, and that was asking for, I want to say it was like $22 million worth of worth of grant funds with a $22 million request. We were fortunate to get almost $16 million to fund that fund the program in 20 uh, for the 2020 cycle. Um, and that resulted in us being able to fund six projects 
And to date, those six projects have closed on over 4,000 acres of land. And that's the bottom stat there. Um, there's still about, I want to say, two, maybe two and a half thousand acres left to be acquired from that uh, cohort of projects. In 2024, or the 2022 grant round, which is the 2024 fiscal year, uh, we received five applications asking for just over $13 million uh, worth of funds. Um, and, and we have uh, asked the legislature, we put in our budget request uh, earlier in October, we asked the legislature for full funding of all five projects on that list. So we're really excited to support this program and keep the, keep the momentum going. Um, this, I just, I brought up the list of projects. They're all really great projects and, and from across the state, um, you know, so we're really excited to see, see um, a really, really strong list of projects this year. Um, I think one, one of the uh, things we really want to focus on uh, in the coming years with this program is really continuing to show the need uh, across the state for this program. I think it's a, it's a little bit different program than, than what we offer in our other program areas. And it's a really, um, I think, filling, filling a, a really interesting and, and neat niche um, in terms of funding programs for recreation, conservation, uh, supporting working lands um, in the state. So that's that's one of our focus areas for the next you know couple of years with the legislature and sort of as we continue to roll out and develop this program is just really showing that there's good strong need for this program across the state. Um, I wanted to showcase, um, you know, David touched on this a little bit, um, you know, some of the different pots of money that, that they've been chasing um, to knit together the landscape uh, of community forest ownership uh, in the Nisqually. Um, and I just wanted to showcase with this slide, some of the programs that I think kind of ha have contributed to uh, that fabric of funding opportunities that that exist out there that community forests can tap into for either starting up, getting developed in addition to our community forest program, or once they're up and running, um, some things that can help support different activities on a community forest. Um, and so the Washington Wildlife and Recreation Program is probably our biggest program uh, in the agency. And that has a variety of different categories that depending on who the sponsor is and kind of the type of project uh, that, that the sponsor is considering uh, could help to fund activities on a community forest program like, um, you know, active recreation or trails development, um, maybe some restoration of wildlife habitat and that, um, those sorts of activities. Um, the non-highway off-road vehicle activities program and the recreational trails program are really more focused on trails, trails maintenance, backcountry recreation, so things like day use sites, uh, campgrounds, you know, again, sort of with all of these programs, the devil's in the details and who the sponsor is and the type of program or project that's being proposed, um, but these are programs that could potentially be tapped into to support things like camping or picnicking or uh, you know, trail-based activities. Uh, the No Child Left Inside program is a partnership program that we manage on behalf of the Washington State Park and Recreation Commission. Um, and that's a really, really great program to support educational activities, um, outdoor education, getting youth outside on the landscape, showcasing, you know, opportunities to work in natural resource management or um, just doing general environmental education. Um, this is a great program to tap into and has a variety of different tiered funding sources, whether you're a new startup organization and all the way to really um, strong developed uh, organizations. Uh, the Family Forest Fish Passage Program and the Salmon Recovery Funding Board programs are all programs that are geared towards, you know, obviously salmon recovery um, and uh, cleaning up fish passage barriers and things like that. 
Um, you know, David alluded to some of the some of the success that they've had in in working with the Salmon Recovery Funding Board uh, funding sources and and others to uh, help acquire the lands that that they're managing. So again, we have a whole whole laundry list of funding programs that you know, depending again on the the project and the sponsor, could potentially help support community forests ongoing into the future. And that's what I have. Uh, so again, just really appreciate the opportunity. Look forward to the questions and and the conversation with the rest of the the presenters. Thank you, Ben, and thank you very much to all of our presenters. Now we are going to shift over to the Q&A portion of the session. So the first question to kick us off, uh, this can really go for any of you. Can you share your experiences engaging with the local community at large about their values and interests? What have you learned about effectively engaging local partners and community stakeholders? And are there approaches that do or do not work effectively? Well, I can take a shot at that to start with anyway. Um, the community forest idea for the Nisqually really came out of our Nisqually River Council and Nisqually Land Trust. So it's really a, a bottoms up approach engaging the community right up front. Um, we're trying to be as intentional as possible with continuing to connect with the local stakeholders and view that really our only path forward to success is gonna be being sure that the community is with us. So it really is a vital element of our of our planning process and our project. Justin, anything you want to add to that? Yeah, you know, a big part of working with the local community is that the Mount Tahoma Trails Association, which is the largest hut to hut free skiing area, you know, has a, a hut that's actually on land trust property that, that section six land is south of us, but their ski trails are across our roads in the winter. And so we have an agreement with them that you know, we start stop our operations so around November 15th and don't start them up again until till early July and so that those roads are available for them to groom and, and use those and so we get the public up in there. Um, we're also working to uh, encourage hunting or allow hunting back on those lands. They, it wasn't that it wasn't allowed but the industrial forest landowner had a you know a fee for entry program and uh, um, we want to make it available but not mean that everybody comes in all at once. So we're trying to figure out a way to have a, a sign up system through the, the state public lands, uh, our private lands access program um, so that we can do that. And we're certainly working with the tribe too and, and you know their, their hunting and gathering rights and things that they want to do. So, um, but no, it's, it's a great question because we, you know, we had a lot of folks at the very beginning and then we had success and we got it there and they're like, great, you, know, you go do that. And so, um, you know, getting the, the local folks involved again is something that we're working on and we had lots of plans and then COVID came along and so we'll dust off those plans, you know, and, and start having more tours um, and, and other events up in the community forest so people can get up in there. Thanks, Stephen, Justin, and Ray, I know you would also put some comments into the, um, the written response on this question. Is there anything else you'd like to share to add on to that answer? Um really it's it's groups um folks that are interested so like you know justin mentioned recreation groups they're key but you know we have some of those that happen so we have a couple of people that you heard in the video that uh represent selkirk uh, alliance for science which is a small nonprofit science-based citizens group and then we have uh sandy nichols who's a local astronomer that runs star parties regularly so once you get people engaged and and regularly putting on activities and events it sort of builds that momentum and synergy and it just you know so you know new things show up and they hey can we do this there and you say yes and then you've got another group of people that are kind of out there um, engaging and using your your community for us and that's exactly what we want to do we just finished our first state certified curriculum for um education here at the at our community forest um, so this is our first winter engaging with the students with our professional staff on i think it's grizzly bears and and bull trout recovery and so we're tying that into the community forest and indian creek and so those are really exciting things but those just don't happen on their own you have to put in you know you have to find the resources and find the right people and put together the the these pieces and then once they start to take hold you start to get more and more 
community um, engagement and use out of the forest. Excellent. Yeah, it's really great to hear about all of the different ways that the community continues to be a part of community forest. And it's cool to see the different manifestations of that in each community forest that's part of um, the whole conglomerate of community forests in the state of Washington. So the next question that we have is, given the challenges you've all spoken to in, in terms of acquiring funding and the small portion of landscape under community forests, how can we expand this model? What other options are there for facilitating more local governance or engagement in forest management? Great question. <laughs> so this community forest is one way. Um, other ways, there's been a recent uptick in the establishment of um, authorities uh, that have been, you know, given to tribes or communities to engage in, not just you know, sort of a community force, but in, you know, our federal lands programs. And there's ways to do that through um, the Good Neighbor Authority and um, those, but those have, you know, they're new, they're relatively new. Um, they have some problems that are being ironed out at the federal level that, that allow a more robust um, community engagement through your municipal um, so like a county or a city have the opportunity through some of those acts to to engage. So there's other ways to engage in um, sort of community based force management uh, that are coming online as we speak. But as far as, you know, um, one of the biggest things I tell people when they ask, well, what can I do? I'm really interested in that. Um, giving your time is always a an important aspect of of you know, engaging that way. But I think the most important thing as you know, you can, you can write a check easy, you can show up easy. Use your voice. Talk to your legislators, whether they're state or federal, and convince them to support these kinds of programs at a robust level, so that these opportunities continue to grow. So if we get 20 applications next year in the state community forest, we don't want to draw the line at five or 10. Um, the goal would be to fund all of the good community forests that come through those programs. Um, the national funding level is, I think it's about $2 million across, you know, it, it's not a lot. I think it upped during COVID through some of the other um, uh, infrastructure bills and whatever it got some more money associated with it but it's really not a lot when you're talking about four hundred thousand dollars per project that really is cost share for something like a state program so it's it's important to use your voice to get your legislators to and encourage them to support these programs and i think another piece of this puzzle at least in the Nisqually, is that you know we'll be able to acquire as much of the private tipper lands as we possibly can but there's going to be public lands around us and the key to landscape management is going to be expanding our management objectives across a broader landscape and so working with our state and federal agencies to adopt similar kind of goals and objectives and strategies is going to be ultimately really important so we've just entered into negotiations with the department of natural resources to think about managing our lands in the upper Nisqually as a single landscape management approach rather than um, split ownership with different goals and objectives. We'll see where that goes, but I think that's a, an opportunity we need to explore. Absolutely. Thank you both for your insights there. Um, and I also just want to see if Justin or Ben have anything to add on to that. I don't. I think they covered it well. Yeah, I don't either. I think this just illustrates like why I love this program so much is because there's this on the fly thinking about like different creative strategies and solutions to these really challenging problems. So appreciate both those answers. Absolutely. And this leads actually pretty well into our next question. Um, so want to definitely thank um, Ray and David for providing some avenues for the general public to support, but we're curious if there are other ideas about people who are interested in supporting community for us as members of the public and what they can do to really advocate for um, getting more uh, support for community for us and being involved in community for us in other ways. Find them. <laughs> Find your local community for us. 
um, or organization that might be able to engage in that process, um, land trusts, watershed councils, whatever those are, um, um, find them, create that relationship and engage. Uh, if you have an existing community forest, there's tons of opportunities to, to volunteer, to participate, to just use and enjoy. One of the biggest um, benefits from community forests is a re-engagement with nature and the outdoor space. I mean, we have physicians writing prescriptions to go outside. If that isn't sort of inspiring or for the wrong reasons, right? I mean, you're getting too much television time, right? You need to get outside. Here's your prescription. Go to the local community forest. That says it all. I mean, if a doctor's writing a prescription to get outside, these are your op these are additional opportunities for you to find the space to get outside um, and to engage with people. And the folks, you know, in being engaged with the Northwest Community Forest Coalition and um, the folks here in different capacities, everybody's open. Every community forest is open. You want to learn about prescribed fire or silviculture or you want to volunteer. It's all there. You just have to show up and ask. And I think every community has that area that's important to them that and maybe this is a, an alternative uh, ownership method and as things have changed, you know, whether it's, you know, Chimicum Ridge up in Jefferson County or Stewart Mountain up near Bellingham, you know, these are places that have always been important to the community and, and that they haven't necessarily access has changed and so if we want to get folks back into those woods you know and still have them be active working for us i think the community forest is the right place and the right system to do that thank you both for that and what role can the public play in helping to promote um getting information about if they know about when those important application deadlines and program announcements are happening to help support not only making sure that people are accessing these forests but also continuing to advocate for the support and at the financial level um at the state um and, and so on yeah i saw that question came from darcy and and she's the she's the one that should know the answer to that um it's it's if you have that interest, you're going to find us, and we have the the Northwest Community Forest Coalition that Ray talked about too, and we're working throughout Oregon and Washington, and we're willing to go to Idaho and and uh, Northern California, but to provide that information to help you start your own forest, to help you find funding for it, uh, help you expand it. We're moving more into management techniques, like Ray talked about. We went and looked at, at prescribed burning at Mount Adams Resource Stewards. Um, you know we. Glad to have folks up again at any time in the Squally to look at our, our thinning regimes and what we're doing. Um, it, it, I mean, it, I, I don't know how we find them. We're not going to do some. We're doing these videos that you saw at the beginning, and those are available. But it's somebody thinking of that an idea or trying to figure it out, and then probably finding the Northwest Community Forest Coalition and finding their local effort, um, or an effort that's close to them, or if not, you know, being willing to step up and do that. But it, you know, I. We've, we've got enough challenges without trying to maybe do a, a huge uh, advertising campaign or something to get people interested. Yeah, I would, I would add to, if, if Ray, you mentioned this a little bit ago of uh, getting involved politically, you know, advocate for these kind of things. You know, in the state of Washington right now, we're spending less than 2% of our budgets, operating in capital budgets, on all of our natural resource agencies combined. I don't know about you, but I tip better than that at a restaurant. And so we're not taking our so. natural we're not taking our natural resources seriously. It's a luxury item, and until we really start taking it seriously, we're going to have a challenge putting things like community forest together. So we need public support for this and salmon recovery and outdoor education programs and all the stuff that's important for natural resources. So get out there and get engaged, Darcy. Get them going. You got it. Well, and and. This is relatively young. I mean, even though the Community Forest Open Space Program with the Forest Service has been around since 2012, we're really kind of just starting to, to ramp up. And so the social media context and the, you know, the email blitzing and all of that stuff is, you know, it's just starting to be created. Like Northwest Community Forest Coalition is just 
you know, people just figured out we need to get together and figure out how to do these things. So the storytelling, the videos, um, I'm really looking forward to the Nisqually video. So they're, these things are the way to do that for us in the community forest, but we couldn't do that without support from the Forest Service. We couldn't do that without the, the coalition. We couldn't do that without Ben's program um, or the advisory committee that set it up. And and that sort of networking and trying to figure out how to message and continue to get the word out about these kinds of things. You know, it's one of our biggest conundrums. When I put Mike's name up on the slide, yeah, I put somebody else's, but we created a position in our natural resources department for information and outreach specifically because we as biologists aren't really good at telling our own story. Um, you know, we're so engrossed in getting the work done, we're not really sort of sharing it. So we had to hire somebody to put that together for us as a as a natural resource department. So it's it's an evolving piece, but storytelling and and messaging are really critical to the long-term success of getting more than a, a meager tip uh, for natural resources. Yeah, and, and Darcy is right in the chat that we can amplify the RCO deadlines and WC and TNC and and then the North Coast Community Force Coalition. And I just uh, I love social media so much. I didn't even think about the fact that we need to be uh, doing more probably in that that space. Um, I think some of it too is that we had a lot of pent up demand in the first round, uh, but these projects they take six months, a year, multiple years to go. Um, and so it's it, it can be difficult to line up the funding and when it's there and when the seller is willing to sell it and everything else. And so um, I think we could have definitely done a better job in the second round at, at, at beating the bushes, the trees, what do we beat, um, to get more projects. And we will in the next one for sure. But it's, it is still this, it's just such an interesting challenge of shifting pieces to, to make a purchase. And, and so many of those um, at the beginning were were very much planned for a long time. We had them going. We had a willing seller that was willing to, you know, wait three to five years, um, you know, and, and find the funding. And so it's, you know, that those were the the low hanging fruit, those first projects, and some of these second round projects too. So we're just going to have to work a little harder. Um, we've got this program. We want to keep it growing. We want to keep it going. There's certainly lands to be purchased. It's just, uh, it, it it it's not as easy the second time or third time around. Well, I think with regard to our program, you know, we across the board in the agency this year, we saw application numbers down. And I think the pandemic had a lot to do with that. I think, Justin, you hit the nail on the head. There was a lot of pent up demand with the first round. And there was this huge flush of projects that came through, you know, and they had that timeline kind of set. Right. And some, even though maybe they didn't get funded through our program, were able to find funding elsewhere. And now I think there's this lag um, in terms of, you know, now that our program is starting to get established a little bit more, um, people learning more about it, we're learning about how we need to promote it and advertise it as an agency um, and make, you know, all these new connections with different, different groups of folks um, that are involved in this space. Um, so it really is a learning process for us as an agency. I think we're building the community as we go. It's a brand new program, and I think the more we continue to, you know, have events like this and, you know, get involved with the Community Forest Coalition, I think just all the more success we'll have. And, you know, I'm always happy to talk about this program um, with anybody, so feel free to please reach out to me at the, at the agency. I'm easy to find, um, and I'm sure uh, y'all can share, share all of our contact information, except for Ray's, because he doesn't want to be contacted. <laughs> so true so true don't call me <laughs> <laughs> no i'm always available but i i'd like to get people to folks that can actually help answer their questions sometimes i've just uh go in too many directions at once yeah and timothy timothy feel free to find me or find anybody at the website about the northeast community forest coalition we'll glad to get you connected up i think our next quarterly meeting which is open to all is january 17th uh, and it'll be online so we can good good place to stop by and get your questions answered i really appreciate that you've all touched on all of these different aspects that kind of go into how this 
the process of creating a community forest can take shape. And it definitely relies on being able to tell a story, develop relationships, and just have so many different complex pieces of timing all work out together. And this leads me into another question that's specifically uh, around the, the partnership between the Nisqually Tribe and the Nisqually Land Trust and how that partnership has developed to be able to have the current management approach. Just again, speaking to that need for relationship development and for um, just the complexity that goes into management and development of a community forest. I'm hoping that Justin and David, you can speak to maybe a defining moment that shaped the partnership between the tribe and the foundation that made this possible. It's simple, right, David? It's just, what, what are you at? 40 years of work together um, makes it work. I mean, we go, I don't know how far back you want to go, but the Nisqually River Council was started in 1987 and has been meeting monthly to talk about issues in the Nisqually watershed um that entire time you know probably we might be up to two hands now in meetings we've missed um in that time and we developed all of those relationships and the tribe has really always taken a lead in that you know billy was a big part of getting it started uh george walter who works for david was one of the early leaders and then david's been chair now for i've been here 18 years he's probably been chair 15 of those years and you know that it's just that close partnership the land trust was spun off from the River Council is our first nonprofit. Uh, George Walter was the founder of that for years, who works for the tribe. Um, and they've just, it has been a long, long history of working together between uh, the tribe and the River Council and all the 23 other agencies that that represents um, and the nonprofits that have, have come out from that. And so when it, you know, when Joe Kane, who was the executive director of the land trust at the time, came back from land camp, which is the, the land trust, United States land trust kind of big conference in, in talking about community forests and something he's heard there and has more history on the East Coast. And at the same time, we were looking at some harvest right in the upper part of the upper busy wild um, that were of concern to salmon. It's like, well, you know, oh, this makes a great idea. Let's see if we can find funding for it. Um, and, you know, we worked with the tribe and the state and got a large PSAR, large cap, Puget Sound Acquisition and Restoration, I shouldn't use uh, acronyms, you know, funding for that first purchase and, and three or four or five other different funding sources put together. Um, and so I don't want to say it was easy, but we had all those relationships there. We had people all kind of rowing in the same direction or pulling on the saw in the same direction or whatever you want to use um, to make it work. And so for us in Nisqually, it's, it's it, there's there's nothing that we can't accomplish together. So we come up with an idea and we'll figure out a way and a solution to that. And that isn't necessarily transferable to every other watershed, but you know, I'm talking to the Puyallup Watershed Council right now. And you know, they've been kind of working away for 10 or so years to have a, a watershed council up there and a variety of different folks. And they're now looking at community forest. And so I had a, a discussion with them and I have a email waiting for me asking me about appraisals and how much they cost, which I'm gonna tell them is way more than you think they do. Um, you know, so we're, we're helping for the message, but you got to start somewhere. And so watershed councils are a great place. And if you don't have one watershed councils in terms of the Washington version of them, Oregon is very different. Um, you, you gotta get everybody at the table and, and at least knowing who each other are and, and breaking down those barriers of different ideas. I mean, you're going to have different things and different thoughts and different directions you want to go. But if you've been sitting at the same table for multiple years, you at least know where they're coming from and it, and it makes everything easier, I think. You want to add to that, David? The only thing I would add is um, we we had the tremendous fortune of having Billy Frank uh, in the Nisqually as a Nisqually tribal member. And in 1989, Billy went to the Nisqually River Council and said, we need a land trust. And the land, and the Nisqually River Council said, okay, <laughs> go do it. And so basically the tribe set it up. And we broadened our table and, and invited the community to participate, but it really was a tribal idea moving forward with tremendous community support. Now we had Billy, but every watershed's got their leaders. They're all out there. And so as long as you can build up that trust that you're not fearful of what the tribe is trying to do, these kind of things are possible everywhere. And we've gotten past that point of lack of trust a long time ago. And the last thing I would say is that one of our commitments early on in the process is that we want to try to solve our problems as neighbors and as a community and not look to regulations and distant bureaucracies to solve the problem. And the land trust and the community forest is very consistent with that approach. 
working with our landowners, working with our communities. And so um, we've developed that trust because we talk the talk and, and walk the walk. Thanks. Thank you very much for that response. I think that uh, this is a consistent theme that comes up in community forests and so many other things around natural resource management that this type of work really moves at the speed of trust and it takes years to really develop that. So I really appreciate being able to see the illustration specifically with what's happened with your community forest and, and how long it took to really make sure that there was a solid relationship and foundation on which to, to be able to have this project come to life. Um, and I also am super excited to see more about this story coming up in the Nisqually, um Community Forest video that'll be coming out again on the um, Northwest Community Forest Coalition video storytelling project. We have time for one last question. I'm going to um, to shoot it over to Ben. So the question uh, for Ben is, can you speak to the differences in how RCO supports new community forest projects as compared to expanding or ongoing projects? Yeah, thanks, Katie. That, uh, it's a it's an interesting question. And one that I think, you know, and Ray will remember this, I think too, when we were discussing like the evaluation criteria with the advisory committee, one that we really wrestled with a lot and how do we you know balance the evaluation of projects across one such a broad spectrum of projects that have different goals and objectives and and projects that are have been established and underway and have you know kind of their funding model their uh, the you know, resource management plan already up and, you know, maybe they're adding to their land base or whatever uh, versus new startup for us and like really ensuring that forests are um, thinking through all of the things that it takes to really manage, uh, you know, a, a community forest. Um, and, and I think we, I, I think we did a pretty good job of balancing that evaluation criteria um, between those sort of different camps. Um, but I'll admit it's a challenge. And I think it takes, um, you know, a good, I think we, the, one of the things that we have going for us in the office is a really, really good cohort of grant managers that can help a prospective applicant talk through different aspects of their problems and point, or of their projects and point them towards funding sources that might help them achieve different goals. And so that's one way that we work just internally in the agency, is just having the sort of institutional knowledge of our grant managers across all the different programs to help sort of provide some of that guidance. Um, you know, but it is a challenge, I think, with community forest projects specifically, balancing those um, those new projects with, with existing projects is, is something that we're still trying to figure out. You know, Ray, I don't know if you or Justin have anything to add to that. I think it'll evolve over time as as more and more community forests are established. Um, there may be an opportunity to shift grant focus to other areas like development and support, you know, mm -hmm. kind of that support perspective. But yeah, it's. Well, thank you very much to all of our panelists. It has been a really great time talking with all of you. And um, I also wanted to give one final shout out to the Northwest Community Forest Coalition Storytelling Project. Um, Rachel's going to drop the link to that in the chat. And I would encourage everybody to go ahead and click that link so you can pull it up and watch videos. Um, when you have a moment, um, we definitely encourage you to check out the full version of the Indian Creek video. There are also two other Washington community forest stories that are available currently, um, including the Chimicum Ridge and Stewart Mountain community forests. And as we mentioned, the video about the Nisqually community forest is currently in production, so keep an eye out for that in the months to come. Our final session of the conference, uh, which is one I'm very much looking forward to also, starts in 45 minutes at 3 o'clock p.m. And the topic for that one is the Pacific Northwest debut of the Climate Smart Wood Group. So see you there. Thanks, everyone. Yep, thanks. Thank you all. Right.